dangerous killers, deadly predators, bloodthirsty creatures. Sharks have fallen victim to these stereotypes. But are these facts or mere fallacy? there to even stay near sharks. They look pretty fierce and <laughs> scary. They still kill people because I think it's part of their nature. People perceive them as dangerous animals because um, of those bull shark attacks in Australia. They apply this to every shark. So I think it's, it's not true. It's a misconception. In 2012, seven humans were killed in shark attacks worldwide, paling in comparison to other animal attacks like crocodiles, elephants and even dogs. Are sharks really as dangerous as we think? In Australia, meat from the gummy shark, also known as flake, is used in fish and chips. Taste-wise and everything, these are sensational. And that's what we use, gummy, gummy shark. Evolving fishing methods have changed the way people caught, ate and even thought about fish. In 2011, studies showed that the amount of seafood caught reached a high of 90.4 million tonnes. This led to concerns that the demand for seafood would soon exceed our supply. We know sharks is in trouble. That's a fact. When you harvest to the magnitude that we have seen in South America and the consumption, indiscriminate consumption in hawker centre, in restaurants, in any sorts of nonsense, it is unbelievable. There is no way to sustain this at this level. It appears the evidence is showing that, that, that you know, there is a reduction in these populations of sharks. Um, but again, it depends on the productivity of the species, how well um, they cope with the levels of fishing. Some of the low productivity shark species won't cope well and you'll see a reduction in the, the population numbers. Um, other more productive shark species can withstand higher levels of fishing and still maintain quite viable um, um, stocks. Overfishing is a concern for a marine ecosystem. If marine life continues to be fished unsustainably, it will lead to a breakdown of the ecosystem. Some examples of overfished species include Chilean sea bass, eels, flatfish, salmon, scallop, shrimp, tuna and sharks. And it's called Shark Point. There's no sharks to see at Shark Point or Shark Alley or any shark thing because these are a significant point where all the sharks end up. They tend to be the, the funnel area of strong current where injured fish ends up and the shark is like, oh, free munch, chook, 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 chook. They're gone. Any healthy reef always have to have sharks. To better understand how sharks are caught, we take you behind the scenes to the harvesting process of sharks in Australia. Uh, the science of shark, uh, there's thousands of strains of different patches of sharks come through the straits, thousands. And they come to mate, they come to eat. And uh, us fishermen, with uh, the, the biodata that we have uh, and the experience that we have, we know which, what times of the month they come through and we, we let to catch them. We usually go between five to 10 days. As long as the weather allows us, we go out to fish. We actually average about eight to 900 nautical miles a trip. Where we are in Bass Strait, it's probably one of the worst seas in the world. Uh, so a typical day is pretty hard. You're wet all the time, you're working, waves crashing over the, the boat. In, in Australia, there's two primary methods for shark fishing. One is gill netting and the other one is hook fishing. Uh, we practice gill netting, um, which is uh, bottom set demersal gill netting, which is very different to pelagic gill netting. Pelagic gill netting is where a gill net floats around the ocean and catches all kinds of things. But bottom set demersal gill netting is set up where um, the, only an animal of a certain size is caught in the net. Um, smaller animals go through the mesh because they're too small and larger animals bounce off the net um, because the net is set very tightly along the sea floor. It's a demersal gill net. So therefore we only harvest a certain size. So large breeding sharks live, smaller sharks that haven't yet had enough time to breed a number of times live and we only take a certain size and year class. Back on land, these fishermen deliver their catch to local factory owners such as Yoshi's brother and company for processing. And when the shark comes in, we first to trim the fins off 
and then we split it in half, take the skin off and packet it in kilo boxes and then deliver to the, to the fish. Uh, a small amount of it will portion it in, in about 120 gram portions. And it's the same thing we sell to the fish shops, fish and chip shops. Uh, about $18 a kilo. Uh, we process around uh, two to three tons of shark a week, every week. So the, the shark is our main, our main source, our main uh, product that we sell. Because uh, we concentrate mostly on fish and chip shops. Uh, the fins, uh, people buy the fins from us, and uh, the cartilage and the skins, we throw them away. Shark's fin soup is a popular tradition of the Chinese culture. Dating back thousands of years ago to the Ming Dynasty, it was a dish served only to the emperor of the royal family. The dish became a popular delicacy and is now part of the big four. Bao, Shen, Chi, Du. A set of exquisite dishes representing prosperity and health in the Chinese culture. We actually work with a lot of these products uh, in these four main categories and um, I would say that uh, well the shark fin demand has dropped uh, and pressure on the other three products has increased because um, restaurants have to make up for the loss in value that uh, shark fin bring to the table. Today, shark fin soup has become a status symbol served to honour guests on special occasions such as weddings, business functions and Chinese New Year. It has always been a tradition to drink shark's fin, maybe because of like some superstition. With the fins only making up less than 5% of the total body weight of a shark, it is also the most valuable part, worth the majority of a shark's commercial value. With the current information collected by experts all over the world, it is apparent that shark numbers have been depleting. However, no one knows for sure exactly how many of these creatures are being fished worldwide. Maybe 73 million, I think, is the latest estimation from a scientist's point of view. I don't see how that number can be um, sustainable in any way to take that amount of sharks out of the ocean globally. You know, it's not, we're not just talking about one specific area, we're talking about shark fins all around the world. And each fishery contributes to others. Sharks, a lot of species, are very migratory. Some of them are very slowly producing. And these are all things that we have to take into consideration when we're thinking about setting up something sustainable. Many believe that the consumption of sharks in soup is the main reason behind the fishing of sharks. You don't have a bycatch of that quantity. There is no way. He's a Pacific target. Shark fin is a Pacific target and it is billions of dollars of uh, businesses. We recognize that there are sharks that are endangered and if the activists want to uh, ban the fishing of such sharks, we will be more than glad to uh, join their campaign. However, I think the banning of sharks fin will not uh, save the sharks uh, because of the strong demand of shark meat in the rest of the world. Ask anyone on the streets how shark fins are acquired and they would tell you. I think sharks are probably being caught with fishing trawlers and I think that their fins are probably being cut off their backs and the sharks are probably being thrown away. Uh, I think taking an animal just to have a fin to make a specialty soup is, is probably from another time, not from the 21st century. That is life finning. Finning happens because um, great value is placed on large fins. So if, if, if a, um, an unregulated fishing boat which fishes in international waters catches large sharks, there is large fins and those large fins, fins are worth a lot of money, a lot, a lot more money than the meat. So the reason it happens is because those large fins are worth so much money. Live finning may have been carried out in the past, but with strict regulations put in place, it is near impossible for fishermen to carry out this illegal practice today. There's a blur between life finning and what I call dead finning. You see, life finning itself is a boring. It is something very cruel, it's wrong. While dead finning, well, as you all know, when the fish or anything is dead, you just harvest it and all that. In Singapore, some wholesalers 
importers and exporters claim that the market for fins has very little impact on the decline in the shark population. The fins are acquired from Spain, Latin America and Australia. These countries consume the shark meat and the fins are of no value. Sometimes they were throw away and discarded or probably, you know, be sold as uh, animal feed. So we add value by telling them that this is something that we can use, that that is a delicacy you know, in our culture. So we add value to the whole industry. The gummy shark is not targeted for fins, it's targeted for eating purpose for the Australian fish and chip shop, okay, that, that sell gummy shark, right? And that's what it's targeted for, right? The fins are a bonus. You know, that's all it is. The shark is going to be caught, served on the plate. You know, it's not going to be caught just for the fins. So there's always uh, this misconception that, yes, it's the Europeans that are eating the sharks for fish and chips. The Asians are really not to blame because we're just taking the fin. But in this day and age, and at this critical point now, it's really not about pushing blame or about saying it's the Westerners and not the Chinese, but it's about how we need to come together to address this very big global problem. Sharks are going to go extinct if we carry on this unsustainable trade. The problem that we're having with environmentalists is that they're, they're grouping all the shark fin products into um, the inhumane practice of finning. Okay, so they're saying to the consumer, if you eat shark fin, then you're supporting um, finning at sea, when well, that's not actually the case. Like Australia, governments around the world have set quotas to regulate the amount of sharks fish sustainably. Our fisheries are very strict in Australia, uh, especially shark. Uh, they're all under this management system and uh, I think now it's about 15,000 tonnes a year can be caught within Australia, shark fisheries. In Australia, we have um, a government body called the Australian Fisheries Management Authority, and that manages all the quota system for fish caught in Australia. Shark fisheries is under this quota fisher fisheries, and what it is is this, the government sends out observers on board the trawlers, and they study how much fish is caught, and they they, they do th through scientific analysis um, how much fish is caught, and uh, they assess whether a fisheries is sustainable or not, and they increase or de decrease a quota system according to this ma this management system. In 1999. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, or FAO, introduced the International Plan of Action for the Conservation and Management of Sharks. The FAO recommends that the entire carcass of a shark be used, and not just the fins alone. Um, I think with the fins, if you use a whole body, fantastic. But if you are just going out there to catch a shark for the fins and then throwing the whole body back, I think it's shocking, terrible. But if you catch a shark, use the meat, you can use your fins. This plan's objective is to ensure the long-term sustainable use of sharks by calling on all fishing nations. I would like to see more governments taking um, responsibility for providing for us long term, for protecting things um, in the ocean specifically because we get so much from there, especially somewhere like Singapore, our appetite for seafood here is humongous. Um, and it's not to say that every single seafood that you eat is bad, we have to take it on a case by case basis, but governments have to start looking into that and really promoting sustainable use. CITES is the UN Convention of International Trade in Endangered Species of Wildlife or Fauna and Flora. It is an international agreement between governments whose aim is to ensure the protection of wild animals and plants. There are over 400 species of sharks in the world, but only eight have been listed as endangered species since the CITES conference in March 2013. We do abide by CITES regulations. Um, we, stay clear of, we stay clear of whatever that is banned on CITES. Uh, and we also agree with the, uh, with the activists on certain uh, species uh, 
certain species in the shark population should uh, actually get more protection under the CITES. Protected shark species include the basking shark, the great white, the whale shark, the oceanic white tip, the paw beagle, the three species of hammerhead, scalloped, smooth and great. According to local wholesaler Melvin Fu, founder of Sin Europe, these protected species are not exploited for their fins. The most viable commercial species that is being exploited or being harvested right now are the blue shark. And they're abundant. And it's not a viable business, it is not sustainable, and the level of greed is unprecedented. And I just say that let the species rest, let them a chance to recover, and we have to have certain control of this. We, there is got to be control. At the moment, there's zero control on this. So the issue is sustainability. And the cause of the problem is overfishing, which is a global issue. If the activists or and the environmentalists were to pull all the resources together, we could solve this problem fast. Fairmont Singapore was the first hotel to stop the sale of shark's fin soup in their restaurants in 2009. This move encouraged other hotels and restaurants to follow suit. So far, many prominent hotel chains have taken shark's fin soup off their menus in order to champion sustainable seafood. It's always been used as an excuse that it is our Asian culture and tradition to consume shark's fin soup. But if you look at culture or traditions in the history of mankind, it's something that is fluid, it's something that can change. Anti-shark fin campaigns like the recent I'm Finished With Fins by Shark Savers Singapore aim to influence consumer choices. However, what do these campaigns ultimately hope to achieve? It's about these little people. I'm worried about one, the kids will never see the shark. Two, it collapsed, it will never come back to the level it is now. Three, the ecosystem is changing really, really fast. You have brought in B, C, D, E, F predators into the stream because the apex predator did not neutralize the equilibrium. So over the years, we have now have cold storage, NTUC, quite a number of supermarkets have taken shark fin off their shelves. Shutting down the shark fin industry cannot save the sharks. Unless you shut down the entire fishing industry, sharks will be caught every day. Unless you shut down the demand for shark meat, shark meat will be caught in other countries for, for their consumption. The campaign should be aimed at stopping shark catching. Or if the sharks are caught accidentally, then those sharks which are caught should be returned back to the sea. That is the way to do it. Many people assume that sharks are used for fin and meat. But what people don't know is that shark cartilage and liver oil is widely used in China. And in some countries, the backbone of the shark is even used as doggy treats. All right. Eventually, let's say, Five years down the road, ten years down the road, shark fins are really prohibited. You ask yourself, will the shark still be harvested for the meat? Is it obvious? Then what are you going to do with all those thousands of kilos of fins that will 